and tax money, state tax money to pay for the ark. That is nonsense. It's totally privately funded. It's because we were granted, like any tourist facility, a rebate on sales tax paid within the park after you're open for a year and functioning. Uh, there's a rebate because they want, if tourist facilities come into Kentucky and they're going to bring this much money into the state, then they'll give you this much in rebates back from, from uh, your sales tax within the ARC. In other words, if you don't want any of your money used for the ARC encounter, don't come. Because as soon as you pay for a ticket, you're, you're helping us, obviously. But if you, if you don't come, none of your money will be used. Uh, so no state money is used in construction of the ARC. It, 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 it's so annoying, they just keep telling that lie over and over and over again, and even though they've been told. And then the other thing that I keep seeing all the time is, oh, Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, they're against science. In fact, on the weekend, the Cincinnati Enquirer had this big headline, religion and science. You know, pitting religion, that's those people in Answers in Genesis and the Ark Encounter, that's religion. But real science says something different. So you know what I thought I'd do today? Thought, we'll broadcast this live on Facebook, and I want to deal with that very topic religion and science, because I want to show you it is not religion versus science. Actually, you know what it is? Religion versus religion. <laughs> that's really what it is, because that's what it comes down to. See, secularists think they don't have a religion. I want to show you they have a religion. It's a religion because they have a belief that life came about by natural processes. So let's deal with that issue here today. You know, the issue of origins is very different to talking about your technology that you build using your five senses in the present. When you're talking about origins, you're saying, okay, well, how did people get here? How did they arise in the first place? How did animals get here? Notice I use real animals, by the way, uh, because of my uh, heritage. Can't use mundane things like deer and bear. <laughs> Man. Uh, and then, how, how did dinosaurs get here? How do we understand dinosaurs? What about death? How can we see a world where we see life and we see death, we see love and we see hate, all at the same time? Seems so contradictory. What about fossils? Where'd they come from? The Grand Canyon, how'd the layers form? How'd the canyon form? How do we get all those different species of dogs that we have? What about degenerate mutants? Where'd they come from? And, and how do we get the so-called races of people? What about the Australian Aborigines? You know the Australian Aborigines, when they were first discovered in Australia, before they met missionaries, had stories, dreamtime legends that sound like Genesis 1 to 11. You can still buy books in some of the museums in Australia, because I have them in my own uh, book collection, where they have recorded these dreamtime legends. And they have legends about a, a, a flood and a man who built a boat and he took the animals and three sons on the boat and it landed on a mountain and there was a rainbow in the sky and woman was weighed while man was asleep and Biami, the creator spirit, had a tree with some sweet honey in a hive of bees and the woman stole some of the honey and that released uh, the, the evil bat into the world and there's been death ever since. You've heard something like that, haven't you? Very similar to the Bible. But you know what? There are legends like that all across the world. Flood legends all across the world in cultures around the world. We'll even have that in one of the exhibits at, at the Ark Encounter. So how do we understand all that? See, here's the problem we've got. We exist in the present, well, most of us exist in the present. And what we're trying to do is to understand how did everything come into being? How do we understand the past? Because we weren't there. We didn't see it happen. It's sort of like a forensic scientist coming in and, you know, seeing the evidence of a murder and trying to reconstruct what happened. Who was the murderer? How did it happen? Uh, if, you know, if you've ever watched any of those programs like... NCIS or, you know, they're ridiculous programs. If you, if you want something real, it's ones that I like to read about, Sherlock Holmes and things like that. So if, if you've ever read an Agatha Christie book, okay, murder mystery, and what happens? They take you through and you've got a problem. The problem is that you weren't there, you don't know who did it, and they're trying to piece it all together for you. And as they're going through, the detective is showing you this and you say, I know who did it, it's the butler. And then you go on, the butler definitely did it. The butler, de oh, it reinforces more and more. Then you get to the final chapter in about the last two pages and they have all these people in a room and the detective's going around. The more he talks about each one of them, the more it reinforces it was the butler that done it. And then two paragraphs before the end, he brings in some evidence they withheld from you from the whole book, totally changes your conclusions. It wasn't the butler, it was someone else you never expected. Waste of time reading this stupid thing. Uh, but see, here's the problem. 
The problem is, if you don't have all evidence, you can come to wrong conclusions. You know, there have been many people convicted of crimes, put in jail, and then later on, as they found new evidence, like now being able to sequence DNA, look at DNA, they realize, wow, that person was innocent. See, the problem we've got is this. No matter how much we know, there's an infinite amount more to know, which means no matter how much we know, we don't know how much more there is to know anyway, which means no matter how much we know, we don't know how much we do know or don't know in relation to whatever there is to know, whatever that is, which means we just don't know much at all, right? And that's a problem. See, think about it. As fallible human beings in the present, the only way you could be sure 100% of having the ability to come to the right conclusion about something is if you knew everything there was to know about everything. The only way you could know for sure about the past is if you were there and you knew everything. Yet, you, you know our problem? Our problem is we don't know everything. But does anyone know anyone who knows everything, who's always been there, who's had written down for us what happened? See, regardless of what anyone else claims it to be, the Bible claims to be exactly that. A revelation of one who knows everything, who's always been there, who doesn't tell a lie. Do you realize if we don't have that foundation for our thinking, there is only one other possibility. Somehow, fallible man has to figure it out. And you know what's interesting? The Bible starts off with this battle between God's word and man's word. It starts in Genesis 2 and 3. In Genesis 2, God makes these two trees in the garden, tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam, you can have all the trees. You can eat of all of them except one tree is a test of obedience. Trust God's word. What did the devil come along in, in Genesis 3 and say to, to Adam and Eve? You can be like God. Did God really say? It was undermining God's word. You can be God. Do you realize that sets the scene? Do you realize all through scripture there's this battle between light and darkness, good and evil. It's really a battle between God's word, man's word. All the way through. It's really a battle between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's all the way through scripture. And you see, that's what I want us to understand is that ultimately there's only two starting points for your worldview. That's why here at the Creation Museum, when you walk through the dig site room and then you see the two scientists who have two totally different accounts of the same dinosaur skeleton, one's from a creationist perspective, one an evolutionist, how can they say different things about the same skeleton Then it takes you to the next room because there's two different starting points. Man by himself tries to figure it out, man who wasn't there in the past, who only has the present, or you take God's word who was there who says here are the events of the past to enable you to have the right way of thinking. Now in our public education system they've basically thrown out God's word and their foundation is it's man by himself who determines truth. And so they would teach something like this, like the late Carl Sagan, the cosmos is all there is or ever was or ever will be. There was a Big Bang billions of years ago. 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang. 13 billion years ago, the stars formed. 4.6 billion years ago, the sun. 4.5 billion years ago, molten earth. 3.8 billion years ago, the first oceans. They know all this from digital photographs, of course. <laughs> now, see, you get it, don't you? Because that's the point. They don't have digital photographs. They were not there. They didn't see any of these things happen. That's their belief that it happened. They can't show you right now that that happened. That's their belief. And we've got to remember that. That's why it gets me when people say, well, don't you think God could have used the, good, uh, the Big Bang? Well, it's not a matter of what God could have used. It's a matter of what he said he did. And you know what? The Big Bang actually has the sun coming before the earth, and the earth is a hot, molten blob for millions of years. The Bible says God made the earth covered with water before the sun. So could God have used the Big Bang? Absolutely not. No way. And there's more and more evidence anyway. It just goes against the idea of the Big Bang. But that's not the purpose of this particular presentation. They believe that as water cools, somehow matter turned into life. That, that just sounds easy, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, matter evolved into life. Yeah, somehow, yeah. Do you, know what, do you know what life is built on? DNA, that molecule for heredity, which is an information system and a language system. There are zillions of bits of information in living things on this planet. Did you know we've never seen matter produce one bit of information? But in living things, there's literally zillions of bits of information. It, to say that life arose by natural processes is absurd. It's a fairy tale. It's ridiculous. Could never happen. Not only that, all the information in the DNA is read by a language. Well, DNA has the information to make the language to read the DNA. 
Where, where'd languages come from? You know what we've always found? Language only comes from an intelligence. Information only comes from information. There's no way life could have come about by natural processes. A man called Charles Darwin noticed that animals change. You know what? He was a great observer. Animals do change. Dogs change. You know what they change into? Dogs. Cats change. You know what they change into? You, this is a bright audience. It's incredible. <laughs> But there's different species of dogs, different species of cats, and basically what Darwin said was, hey, over millions of years, all these little changes add up to big changes, and there's this one big tree of life. Many people don't, un don't realize the implications here. Do you realize that evolutionists actually teach that, that humans share genes with not just apes, but also plants? Because they're all on the one tree of life. The, the Smithsonian actually has a display that says we're related to bananas. Bananas, if you're going to talk in American. Uh, <laughs> banana trees. You know, when you walk out in the gardens, you'll see we have beautiful banana trees over there in the rainforest area. You can go over and say hi to them. <laughs> you're supposedly shared genes with them. By the way, if you do, if, you, if, if, you're, true, if you're consistent of an evolutionist and you say we shouldn't eat animals because, you know, we're animals and they're our relatives, well, you shouldn't eat plants either, which would solve a big problem uh, for, for those people. But <laughs> as we go on here, uh, Darwin believed that over millions of years, one kind of animal changed into another, ape-like creatures into people. It involved death over millions of years. See, see the secularist only lives in this present world. They look around, what do you see? Death. Everyone dies eventually. We, we see death all around us, as well as life, we see death. So you know what they assume? It's always been like that. So when they look at a fossil record, all these layers across the earth, some of those layers of the Grand Canyon extend across the continental US and the continents around the world, and they're full of dead things, they assume that all this will happened over millions of years, and they put together this geological time scale. So it's death. Actually, they Carl Sagan said the secrets of evolution are time and death. Time and death equals man. Time and death equals life. The Bible doesn't put time and death together. The Bible puts sin and death together. And then they have a statement of purpose. Uh, Richard Dawkins was on a television program in Australia, actually, and he was asked about life. And, you know, he's a famous atheist. Let's see what he says. Well, the answer to the question of uh, what's going to happen... When, when we die. It depends whether we're buried, cremated, or give our bodies to science. Um, I, I'm, um, I'm Can I just in... say this? Uh, if, you, if you're actually an agnostic and you keep aside this small portion of your brain um, for subsequent proof, I mean, you might get presented with that proof when you die. The brain is what we do our thinking with. The brain is going to rot. That's, that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, think about this. From an atheist perspective, when you die, you cease to exist. Just right. And when people knew you die, they cease to exist. So as you, when you die, you won't know those people live. When they die, they won't know you lived. Eventually everyone dies and no one will know anyone ever was. What is the point of anything? Why do they even bother arguing against creationists? What does it matter in the long run? If when they die, they cease to exist and won't even know they're arguing with creationists, why does it matter? Think about it. It's ridiculous. But do you know what Richard Dawkins and people like him want? Don't you teach kids that God created and, and, and that we're sinners in need of salvation. We can live for eternity with God. No, teach them a real message that, that you're just an animal. When you die, you cease to exist and life has no meaning and purpose. Become an atheist. That's the message of the public education system. That's what it really is, if we're honest. The Bible has such a different message. The Bible gives us a history. You know, God says... I've always been here. Let me tell you what happened. I created a perfect world. The first man, Adam, sinned. Death is a consequence of sin. There was an event called the flood of Noah's day. If there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And what do we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And then there was an event called the Tower of Babel where man rebelled again. So God gave different languages. And so people would move away from each other and develop different cultures and, and different combinations of genes would be in, in, in different groups. And they'd have distinguishing characteristics, but we're all one race going back to Adam, which would explain why you have such similar flood legends and creation legends in cultures all over the world, the real records in the Bible. And then God's son steps into history. Promised back there in the Garden of Eden. Do you know the first time we read about Jesus? It's really Genesis 
I'll put enmity between you and the woman, your seed, her seed. He shall bruise your head, you bruise his heel. The one who will come to crush Satan. And then Genesis 3.21, the first blood sacrifice is a covering for their sin, the origin of clothing right there in Genesis. God's son stepped into history to be Jesus Christ, the God man. A man brought sin and death into the world. We need a man to pay the penalty for sin and death, but it has to be a perfect man. It can't be one of us, but it has to be because we're all related back to Adam. What did God do? He stepped in the history and was perfect, in, in the person of his son to become the perfect man, the God man, to become our relative, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, offers a free gift of salvation. We actually date our calendars from that event. We live in 2016. And then one day there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. Do you, do you realize all this has already happened? And we're right now about here. Or we could be here. Or here. Or here. Or there. There. We're somewhere here. Okay. We're actually in the last days. We've been in the last days ever since God's son stepped into history to be the God man. We've been in the last days. We just don't know how last we are. We just know we're more last than we were because that's, that's for sure. Okay, so then what are we told? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow, that's a little different to the message of Richard Dawkins. Now, I have people say to me, now, wait a minute. Mr. Ham, I don't understand. You gave two totally different accounts of the history of the universe. That's right. But they're totally different. Yeah, they are. Big bang, no big bang. Billions of years, thousands of years. No global flood, global flood. Adam made from dust, woman from his side, man evolved from ape-like creatures. And so it goes on. How can you have two totally different accounts? This is why when I debated Bill Nye on this stage right here, I wanted to teach people how to think correctly about this. Because you see, a lot of people say, why didn't you give Bill Nye all the evidence that proves creation? Well, Bill Nye and I have the same evidence. Creation scientists and evolution scientists all have the same evidence. We've got the same earth. It's not the evidence that's different. Think about that. We have the same Grand Canyon layers. I actually said, Bill Nye, we could go to the Grand Canyon and we can agree on this layer is a sandstone layer. We can agree on how thick it is. We can agree on how big the sand grains are. We can agree it, 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 it's right there in, in Arizona. We can agree on these things. You know what we don't agree on? How long it took to get there because neither of us were there to see that. We have the same fossils. See this fossil? We have it at the Creation Museum here. Fish swallowing another fish. Guess what? If an atheist looked at it, he would have the same fossil. <laughs> It's not the fossil that's different. In the dig site room, it's not the dinosaur skeleton that's different. It's the two scientists' explanations that are different. We have the same dinosaurs. We have the same animals. We have the same people, humans, same DNA, same radioactive elements, same universe. And that's why I said Bill Nye and I have the same evidence. It's a battle over the same evidence. So if it's not the evidence that's different, what is different? Your starting point that gives you a foundation for the worldview you have or your set of glasses that you put on to interpret the evidence. You see, the older you get, the more you're likely you have to wear glasses. Okay, but did you know every one of us wear glasses? Because, you see, we all have on a set of glasses that is really a worldview that we use to understand the evidence of the present. If you start with God's word, it says in the beginning God created, you're saying no, life didn't come about by natural processes. So when you look at DNA, that molecule of heredity, you find it's an information system and a language system. That confirms an intelligence behind the universe, does not confirm natural processes. When you start with God's word, it says God made kinds of animals and plants to, uh, after their kind. The implication is they reproduce after their kind. You find that dogs always produce dogs, cats always produce cats. You can have lots of different species of dogs, but they're still dogs. By the way, Noah didn't need to take all the species of dogs on the ark, and he took two of each kind, probably more the family level of classification. The more you understand genetics, the more you realize it confirms there are distinct groups of animals and plants, not that one group can change into another. As you look at people groups, 
What do you find? Well, even the Human Genome Project, when they mapped the human genome in the year 2000, you know what they said? There's only one race, the human race. Well, that's what he expected if God made Adam and Eve. We're all one race, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and remember that. See, and, and that's where people ask questions and say, well, wait a minute, if there was only Adam and Eve, then where did Cain get his wife? And, and, and you know, how could that be? Well, the Bible says Adam and Eve had sons and daughters, which means originally brothers married sisters. And then people say, but my boy, wait, my brother's not allowed to marry. you're not allowed to marry a relative? I've got news for you. If you don't marry a relative, you don't marry a human, then you have a bigger problem. Okay? <laughs> Do you realize when you get married, you marry your relative? It's just today you don't marry a close relative. Think about Abraham. He was married to his half-sister. It wasn't a problem. When was the first time God said in the Bible, no longer should close relations marry? It wasn't until the time of Moses. You see, you can only understand this when you understand a biblical perspective of history. Adam and Eve's genes were perfect. But over time, because of sin, now our genes accumulate mistakes. Today, there's 6,000 years of accumulated mistakes. So the problem is, if you're closely related and you were to get married, it's more likely those mistakes can get together and cause deformities in the offspring, which is why it's better to marry someone further away in relationship from you, but you still marry your relative. And see, it's the Bible that gives us the doctrine that marriage is to be a man and a woman, based upon the fact God made a man and a woman. Actually, you know what God says in Genesis 1? He made male and female. Wow. I would have never thought that. And that's why we have male and female bathrooms at the Creation Museum, and we will have male and female bathrooms at the Ark. <laughs> Do you know Jesus in Matthew 19, when he's asked, asked about marriage, said, haven't you read, he which made the beginning made the male and female? Quotes from Genesis. And for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and there'll be one flesh, quoting from the creation of woman taken from Eve's side in Genesis. You know what Jesus is saying? Marriage is a man and a woman. What is wrong with you people? And that's what we, it, it's so clear in Scripture. But if you don't believe Genesis, of course, marriage is whatever you want to make it to be. So we need to tell President Obama about the book of Genesis. He's heard of the Bible, but he misquotes it and quotes it out of context whenever he uses it. That's really sad. But you know what, people? Here's what I want you to understand. Do you, and, and, and even for fossils and rock layers, the more you look at them, they show evidence of catastrophism. We would say associated with a flood, not slow processes over millions of years. Because what we're saying is this is the right starting point, God's word. Now, this is where you get the newspapers and like the Cincinnati Enquirer this weekend. Ah, oh, but... Science shows, by the way, science doesn't show anything. They say, but science says, science doesn't say anything. Scientists say something, but science doesn't say anything. And whenever they use the word science, it's, oh, these people with the Ark Encounter, Creation Museum, Answers in Genesis, they're all about religion. They believe the Bible, that's religion. But people who believe science, they don't believe that stuff about the flood and creation. That's why with the Bill Nye debate, I said to Bill Nye, we have to define what we mean by the word science. I mean, people use the word science, but what does it mean? Anytime anyone says to you science, you say, stop right there and tell me what you mean. Define the word. Because if you look up the word science, you find its origin is from the classical Latin scientia, which means to know. And if you look up the dictionary definition of the word science, it means state of knowing or knowledge. So when anyone says to you, you people are on about religion, we're on about science, what do you mean science? Because the word science means knowledge. And what I showed at the Bill Nye debate was there's different types of knowledge. You use your five senses in the present to develop technology that's experimental or observational science. And doesn't matter whether you're a creationist or an atheist, you can be involved in observational science and build our technology or put a, a rover on Mars. That's observational science. But when it comes to talking about the past, our origins, when we weren't there, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, wait a minute, now we've got, now we've got a problem. We don't have that in front of us. That's historical science. See, there's a big difference between observational science and historical science. Uh, let, let, me, so let me see how good you are working this out. Okay, so Bill Nye and I go to the Grand Canyon, and I say, ah, there's a sandstone layer. There's a sandstone layer. 
We see it in the present. Observational or historical science? Observational. Observational. Oh, look, it is 23 foot thick. Observational or historical science? Observational. Oh, look, we can measure the, the sand grains. Look how their diameter averages, whatever it is. Observational or historical science? Ah, ah, and I believe it was laid down in the flood of Noah's day. Observational or historical science? Historical science. And Bill Nye says, oh, no, it was laid down over millions of years. Observational or historical science? Histori historical science. See the difference? You know, the public school textbooks really indoctrinate kids and brainwash them in an atheistic worldview. For instance, this is one of the textbooks used in the public schools in America, and they say science can only be used to explain things by natural processes. Supernatural explanations for natural events are outside the bounds of science. Wait a minute. Who decided that was the definition of science? People who don't believe in the supernatural decided that. What are they saying? Students, we're telling you whenever we use the word science, what we mean is naturalism because we do not believe in the supernatural. So that's how we define the word science. They have just brainwashed the kids into a particular definition of science based upon their atheistic worldview. You know what naturalism is? It's another word for atheism. Now, let me illustrate this with Bill Nye. Let me show you how he mixes, and this is what the secularists do all the time, and this is what they do in the newspapers all the time too, in the public school textbooks. They, miss, they mix historical science and observational science together, and they call it science. That's what they do. You watch. Here, here's Bill Nye. And you can show the earth is not flat. You can show the earth is not 10,000 years old. Hmm. You can show the earth is not flat. I agree. There's the earth from the Galileo spacecraft. Speed it up. And you can show the earth is not thousands of years old. You mean it has labels on it? <laughs> so you can't observe the age of the earth. But you can observe the earth from space. See the difference? You can't observe this history of millions of years Big Bang. You can't observe the history of creation, the entrance of sin and death and the flood and the Tower of Babel either. They're both beliefs about the past. But see, Bill Nye doesn't understand that. These secularists, you know what it is? They, they, they put up straw men to continue to perpetuate their, their fairy tale ideas to try to force their secular dogmas on the culture. That's what they're doing. For instance, Bill Knight, to him, he does not say, you know, these Christians who believe the Bible, they actually believe in things like aspirin and antibiotics and airplanes. Wow, it's a big mystery. How can you believe in the Bible and believe in an airplane? You, listen to him. Apparently, people with these deeply held religious beliefs, they embrace that whole uh, literal interpretation of the Bible as written in English uh, as a worldview. And at the same time, they accept uh, aspirin, antibiotic drugs, <laughs> airplanes, but they're able to hold these two worldviews. And this is a mystery. Wow, what a mystery that Christians actually... I believe the Bible and I get on an airplane. That doesn't make sense. How can that be? They're two totally different things. See, look, I know Bill Nye is called Bill Nye the science guy, and I don't want to take that away from him. Um, so I didn't want to call, say, Ken Ham the science guy or something like that. So because in Australia we call guys blokes, I came up with the idea that, hey... With me, when I'm talking about aspirin and smoke detectors and airplanes and antibiotics, that's Ken Ham, the observational science bloke. When we're talking about origins, that's Ken Ham, the historical science bloke. But here's the point. When Bill Nye is talking about aspirin and antibiotics and somehow that just went, oh, well, that's nice, isn't it? Let me try to reset this for you. Okay, let's see if this comes back on here for us. And we wait a minute. And see, there we go. All right. Computers are evil things. <laughs> Very evil. Yes. I'm convinced that when Jesus cast the demons into the pigs and, and then they went and drowned in the sea and then they waited for computers. <laughs> and that's where they reside today. So, when Bill Nye is talking about smoke detectors and... Aspirin and antibiotics and airplanes. See, 
You can use your five senses in the present. He's an engineer and you can build things. What? A Christian can do the same. But when it comes to talking about origins, you don't have that. That's when he, that's a different sort of science. And see, that's the point that we need to understand. And you know, Bill Nye has been saying, he's been saying it again recently. If you, if you teach kids creation, it's going to destroy technology. You know the question I asked Bill Nye at the debate? Can you name one piece of technology that could only have been developed stating, starting with a belief in molecules to man evolution? He's never answered that because there is none. There's no piece of technology that has anything to do with molecules to man evolution. None. Because, see, there's a difference between observational science and historical science. Now, the role of observational science is this. When you use observational science and you look at biochemistry, DNA, it confirms an intelligence behind the universe, not natural processes. When you use observational science to look at genetics, it confirms separate kinds, not that one kind changes into another. When you use observational science with people groups, it confirms one race, not different races that evolved at different levels. And when you apply observational science to fossil layers and to uh, rock layers and so on, it confirms catastrophism associated with the flood, God's word, not man's word, because the Bible is the right starting point. Now, let's apply this. That's just the introduction. Took all that to get to where I want to be. Okay, so now to get on with my talk. So I have people who say to me, look, I'm not a Christian. Don't give me that Bible stuff. Give me some evidence that Christianity is true. You prove to me from evidence, but don't give me the Bible. I have many people come to me over the years and say, look, I'm, I'm talking to someone who's not a Christian, and they want to know what's the, I want to know what's the best evidence to deal with them. I can't use the Bible. I don't believe the Bible. Who's heard that sort of thing said or before? Oh, a lot of us. Hmm. Now, I want you to be thinking about this. So if you say, okay, what's the best evidence, but I can't use the Bible, then there is only one other starting point left, and what is it? Man's word, you just forfeited the rate. You've given it over. And people, do you know that's a contributing reason to why Christians haven't been successful dealing with issues like abortion and gay marriage and other issues like that in the culture? Because many Christians have this idea, you can be neutral. If you're on about the Bible, that's religion. So we won't talk about the Bible and we'll be neutral. There's no position that's neutral. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you don't gather, you scatter. Friendship with the world is at war with God. Those who rebel against God suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The carnal mind is at enmity against God. In other words, there is no neutral position. And yet how many times do Christians have this idea, oh, if we talk about the Bible, that's religion. And you know what's happened? The world has indoctrinated us. We're religious because we believe the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. They don't, they, they, they don't believe in God. They're saying, because we have nothing to do with God, that's, that's not a religious position. A religion is a concept, a system of belief held to with ardor and faith. They have a faith position that it all happened by natural processes. They have a religion. And ultimately, there's only two religions in the world, God's word, man's word. See, here's the problem with many Christians today. It's sort of like two knights. You imagine two knights fighting and one says to the other, now before we begin, you throw down your sword. Oh, that'd be a great idea. I'll throw my sword away. Okay. You'd say, that'd be stupid. We have a sword, the word of God. And yet many Christians are throwing it away because they think we've got to argue on neutral ground. And here's the problem. Here's a secularist talking to a Christian. Okay, put down your Bible. Let's talk on neutral ground. Okay, I'll put down my Bible and come over on neutral ground and you win. And you see, that's why we lose so many of the battles. And we've also got to remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've got all these people. Oh, you listen to some of these people today in the church arena and some of these leaders and they get all philosophical about, you know, we've got to have all these, we've got to develop these different countercultures and do this and do that to develop engagement and relational stuff and all the rest of it. You know what they're not on about? The word of God. It's God's word that convicts. It's only God's word that saves. Now, I want to give you an example of someone trying to be neutral and how it doesn't work. A number of years ago, there was a Christian in Australia who was elected to parliament and he was on the Q&A program. And I'm, I don't show you this to denigrate someone, not at all, this fine Christian man, but 
I want to show you, he, he was on a program with Richard Dawkins. He had opportunity to witness to millions of people in Australia. And he tried to be neutral, just like most Christians do. The audience saw the inconsistency. And you know what? I want to show you what happened. Because when Christians try to be neutral, the secular world loves that. Because then they've already won. And the other thing he did was this. At the end of this little bit of the discussion, he's asked, well, where do you think human beings came from? You watch what he does. He puts his hand on Richard Dawkins' hand and said, you might want to ask him. He's got firm views. Oh, of course, the atheists know what they believe. We don't. Okay, watch it for yourself. <laughs> Richard, you'd like to respond. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you believe the, the world is less than 10,000 years old? Look, uh, now, do you believe that? Look, I, I think that there are a lot of questions in this area, and I think people will come to their own conclusion. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to force people into one way or the other. We're not being asked to force. You're not being asked to force. You're a new creationist or an old Earth creationist. Yes. So, which so is it, Steve? You're, you're, a, you're a young Earth creationist who believes the world is less than 10,000 years old. You're a... A, a parliamentarian in Australia who believes the world you live in is less than 10,000 years old. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that, by the way. You're saying that I said it was 10,000. OK. I okay. didn't say that. OK, no, you, did, you didn't say that. Do you? So, Do you believe well, it? No, so it is an open question, though. Uh, Look, I, is, I think, is that what you actually believe? Look, I, I, think, I think that the, the science today will discover more and more, but I think that most Australians come to a view that either believe that it, we evolved or we, we, we came from creation. And I think that, you know, people are, you can believe whatever they like on that issue. I'm not trying to force that issue onto anyone, Tony. So where did human beings come from? Well, you in may well ask this guy. He, he's, no, he's, no, he's got firm no, views on just, it from that just perspective. In, in from your there. view, I'm just interested. That to me is representative of where most Christians are at. And where, uh, sadly, a lot of the church has trained them to be. And you know, there's a verse of scripture that says, if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? And if, if you stand back and look at it, here's what's happening in this world. Secularists all around the world, in the universities, in the public schools, through TV and the newspapers, secularists all have a unified view. Oh, there are differences here and there, but everything happened by natural processes. There's no God. Man evolved from ape-like creatures. Life arose in some primeval soup. Big Bang. It's all basically a unified view. But when you go to the church and you ask Christians, and you go to the Christian colleges, seminaries, and Bible colleges and ask the majority of Christian leaders and Christian academics, what do you believe? Here's what you hear from the church. Well, I don't really know. Well, I don't think Genesis is meant to be a book of history anyway. Well, I think it's a book of history, but, but I think it really represents evolution. I think God might have used evolution to bring man into being. Well, I don't think that. I think he used evolution for the animals, but I think he made Adam and Eve separately. Well, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, really, I, I, I think that uh, the days really are long periods of time. I believe in the day age theory. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I take the millions of years and I put them in between between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and I have a gap of millions of years. Well, I don't know. I put the millions of years in verse 1, and I think the rest of it is just God teaching us about, about you know, the promised land or something like that. I have the cosmological temple view. Well, I'm not really sure. I, 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 think, I believe in theistic evolution. Well, I believe in threshold evolution. Well, I believe in the framework hypothesis. And people, you know, you've got all these different views. Theistic evolution, gap theory, framework hypothesis, threshold evolution, whatever it is, day-age theory, gap theory, local flood. Oh, but trust in Jesus. And the trumpet gives an uncertain sound. You know what is unified about all those views in the church? I'll tell you what is unified. They're all trying to take man's view of millions of years and try to fit it into the Bible, which is why they've got all these different views and they come up with all these creative ways of doing it because none of them work. There's only one that works, and that's taking God's word as written. That's the only one that works. And we have all these young people growing up in our churches and they're hearing all these different things about gap theory or this or Genesis doesn't matter or whatever and they have no idea what to believe but they're told you can believe what you're taught at school and the university. That doesn't matter. You can reinterpret Genesis. Who cares about it? Just trust in Jesus, Donnie. Two-thirds of young people leaving the church in America by the time they reach college age and very few returning. Look at England today. The church has catastrophically declined in regard to its impact on the culture. And people compromise with God's word is rife in that nation. Just as it is here. And yet we still have most of our church leaders, not all, but the majority who will not take a stand on God's word at the beginning. 
You know, the Bible goes on to say faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The word of God is living, powerful, sharp, and any two-edged sword. It's God's word that goes forth from his mouth, shall not return to him void. And so people say to me, well, how do you think you should then deal with this? When someone comes to me and says, I'm not a Christian, I don't believe the Bible, don't give me this Bible stuff. First of all, in my mind, I say to them, they, and they say to me, give me some evidence without the Bible. I say, do you think I'm an idiot? I don't say that verbally, I just say it up here. Think I'm an idiot? <laughs> I'm going to give up my starting point so that you can win. I'm not that stupid, mate. So here's how I say it. You don't believe the Bible? No. Guess what? What? I do. You got a problem with that? Come on, make my day. <laughs> do you know why many Christians will not do that? I think there are two major reasons. One is most Christians don't even know they have a starting point. We've been brought up in a, in, a, in, a, in a church environment where the Bible's over here, or, or, or Genesis is over here, and, and you've got then all these issues, and the Bible's sort of here, and, 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 and you've got these issues of abortion and so on, and, and, and gay marriage, and you've got these doctrines over here. They don't understand that the Bible, beginning in Genesis 1 to 11, is like the foundation for a house. All of our doctrines are founded in Genesis. If you don't understand the history about creation and one man and one woman, you're not going to understand about one race. If you don't understand the history about the flood, you're not going to understand about fossils. You will not understand about dinosaurs if you don't understand, well, it's a modern word anyway, that, that God made all the kinds of land animals to live beside Adam and Eve and two of each kind to get on Noah's Ark. You will not understand why there are flood legends around the world if you don't understand the Tower of Babel. You will not understand any of that. You will not understand that marriage is a man and a woman if you don't have the history in Genesis 1 to 11. You will not understand that clothing was given by God because of our sin. That's why the animals don't wear clothes. We do. And it's a picture of, of the gospel right there in Genesis. The first blood sacrifice they're covering for their sin. You will not understand the, what, what sin is unless you understand original sin in Genesis 1 to 11. You will not understand why Jesus is called the last Adam if you don't understand the first Adam. You will not understand why we need a new heavens and new earth if you don't understand what happened to, to the one God made. You will not understand why we die if you don't understand the origin of death in Genesis. And see, there's another reason why Christians won't say, come on, make my day. Because then they're going to ask questions. Well, where did God come from? Well, how do you know the Bible's true? What do you mean? Science has disproved the Bible. We live in a scientific age. Where did Cain get his wife? What are the races of people? What do you do with dinosaurs? What about carbon dating? What do you do with the Big Bang? Didn't we evolve from animals? And most Christians don't know how to answer the questions. And they don't train their kids how to answer the questions. And then we wonder why their kids doubt and walk away from the church. And you know there's another issue. You know what the other issue is? Non-Christians think they don't have a worldview. Uh, or don't have a foundation, a religion. And see, that's another problem we have to deal with. I had an atheist who came into my office to interview me just, over, just under nine years ago, actually, just over nine years ago, when the museum opened. And she was on contract to the BBC in England. And she came in to interview me for a radio program. And she said... Now, you admit you start with the Bible. I said, that's right. She said, you're not prepared to change anything in the Bible, are you? And I said, no, of course not. She said, see, that's religion. She said, we're real scientists. We start with evidence. And that's what they teach in the public school textbook. Scientists start with evidence. And from that evidence, we develop our theories. And when new evidence comes along, we're prepared to change. You're not prepared to change. I said, well, I'm not prepared to change what's in the Bible. She said, see, that's really... She said, your views are set. My views are not set. I'm prepared to change. Huh, really? Yes. Dr. Scott, yes. You're an atheist. Yep. You don't believe in God? Of course not. You don't believe the Bible's account of creation? No. You're not even prepared to consider it? Of course not. Are you prepared to change any of that? Well, she was not because she had a, a religion her religion was there's no God Bible's not true everything happened by natural processes that's her religion she doesn't start with evidence she starts with the foundation man determines truth that's her religion people we have got to be out there saying atheism's a religion secularism's a religion you know when they say oh you can't use taxes 
in the public school to teach religion, the government has a state religion. They're using our taxes to teach a state religion, the religion of atheism to generations of our kids. And then people say to me, well, wait a minute. That means this person here is not going to change their interpretation of the same evidence we all have unless they change their starting point down here. Exactly right. How do they change their starting point? Well, that's an interesting question. Because no human being can do it. The Bible says humans are dead in trespasses and sin. Those of you who are not Christians are dead in trespasses and sin. And we can't raise dead people. Only God can. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who does good. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. It's God who saves. We can't save ourselves. And then people say to me, well then, what's the point of doing what you're doing? You know, God's word also says it's not, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And how shall they call on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear, uh, believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Always be ready to give a defense, to give an answer. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God is raised from the dead. In Jude it says, contend for the faith. And, 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 and we're told in the Bible, go into all the world and preach the gospel and, and, and to make disciples. And, and you put those two together and you say, wait a minute, on the one hand you're dead, by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God. On the other hand, get out there and preach, get out there and preach the gospel, make disciples, contend for the faith and give answers for what you believe. How do we, how do we understand all that? Let me bring it together for you. Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. Lazarus couldn't raise himself. Only the resurrection of life can raise a dead. And what happens? Jesus said, take away the stone. Now, he could have moved the stone with, with a word or a thought. But you can move the stone, so you go and do that. But what you can't do, then Jesus will do. Take away the stone. Now, you take away the stone, you do your bit. Now, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth, was raised from the dead. All the way through scripture, I see man's responsibility, God's sovereignty. Man's responsibility, God's sovereignty. Our responsibility. Get out there and teach. Preach. Give answers for what you believe. Contend for the faith. Do your best to move those stumbling blocks. Answer questions about carbon dating and dinosaurs and all those questions that they have today to show you've got answers. You can defend your faith. But always make sure that as you do that, you point them to the word of God that raises the dead. And that's what you'll notice about answers in Genesis through the Creation Museum and through the Ark. Yes, we're giving answers. We're giving answers to defend our faith. And we're answering the skeptical questions of this age. But we never divorce that from pointing people to the word of God and the gospel that saves. Because that's what it's all about. And then that brings me to, to just sum this up for you, because this is a whole other topic. We could, we could talk for hours. In fact, I think I'm speaking on Friday here, and I'll probably deal with, with this aspect, the relevance of this, in, in a different way. I always give different talks during the week. But here's what I, 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 how I want to apply it. There's been a battle between God's word and man's word ever since the beginning. The battle in America today, or in Australia, or in Canada, or in the United Kingdom, it's the same battle. The battle has never changed. It manifests itself in different ways, but the battle's always the same. People often in America, they say to me, I have reporters say to me, so how do you view the culture war? And I say, it's not really a culture war. It's a clash of worldviews. Because, you see, when you start with man's word, ultimately anything goes. You're just an animal, why not abort babies? Marriage, however you want to define it. You start with God's word, we're made in the image of God. Abortion would be murder. Marriage is to be a man and a woman because God made marriage. 
You see, there's a clash of two worldviews, the absolutes of Christianity and, and moral relativism, because there's two different foundations, God's word and man's word. And this nation of America once had a predominant Christian worldview. Much of our Western world really did. A predominant Christian worldview that permeated the culture. Because even, even non-Christians used to build their thinking on God's word. Because that's where, that's where their, their, their worldview came from in, in the West. It was predominantly a Judeo-Christian ethic because it came from the Bible. That's why marriage was a man and a woman and abortion was wrong. But the more you raise up generations and take them through an education system and tell them, no, God's word is not true. It's man who determines truth. The more you'll see the collapse of Christian morality and increasing moral relativism, which is exactly what we see happening in our culture. That's what's going on. And that's why we need to understand that issues like euthanasia, abortion, gay marriage, they're not the problems. They're the symptoms of the problem, which is a foundational problem, which is a problem of two religions. And really what's happened in America, and President Obama has led the way in this, to change America, to change the religion of America from God's word predominantly to man's word. And much of the church has helped by saying, we don't need Genesis, it doesn't matter, we'll send our kids to the world's education system, you can teach them whatever you want, that's all right, we'll just tell them to trust in Jesus. And now we wonder why they have a different worldview. Well, that's the introduction. So let me just tell you that, hey, our ministry is an apologetics ministry. We want to provide you with answers to the skeptical questions of this age. My father was a teacher. He didn't just teach us what the Bible said. He would be researching what the liberal critics were saying to make sure we knew how to answer those who would try to get us to doubt God's word. And people, that's why we have such an emphasis on apologetics. Thousands of articles on our website. 25 million users a year on our website. Encourage you to go there. Has a kid's website. You got any questions, use our search engine. Type in the question. You'll find you'll get uh, answers to most of the questions as you're going to ask. Because we've been asked them over the past 40 years. If you sign up on one of those sheets you received when you came in to get our newsletter, be a part of the ministry, to pray for us, find out about the ark, the museum, our resources, we'll give you a free DVD of my testimony. It was done at a church a number of years ago. We have some specials for you. The series here, the pocket guides, they're normally uh, $6 each. They're great little booklets, beautifully done. We'll let you have them for a dollar each. My favorite witnessing booklet, Begin. It's a book that starts with Genesis 1 to 11, the foundational history, Exodus 20, the law, the book of John, the life of Christ, the book of Romans, the gospel in detail, the last two chapters of Revelation, new heavens and new earth. We have a summary of the Bible in the middle. So we, we actually explain the gospel starting at the beginning. Too many Christians try to start at the end to explain the gospel. You've got to start at the beginning. And then we have 10 of the most asked questions that cause people to doubt the Bible. We give you answers. And then what does it mean to be saved? And we let you have that at a discounted price. We have a You Choose program. Uh, you look for the green dots on the books and the DVDs. You can package them together in all sorts of combinations and get them at discount prices. My book, The Lie, is really the textbook of this ministry. Why does it matter? This really challenges Christians to believe God's word starting in Genesis, how important it is, how foundational it is to all of our doctrines, and why we've lost our culture. And then these two books, already gone and ready to return, they are the most definitive uh, books dealing with the state of the church in our Western world. We had America's research group go and research the two-thirds that have already left the church and the millennials that are left in the church. And it tells you what they believe, why they doubt the Bible. You know, it, it all comes down to apologetics, what they were taught at school, not being taught how to defend their faith in church. A lot of our Sunday school material being fluff and stuff and entertainment and shallow, not teaching them doctrine, not teaching them apologetics. But this, this is a challenge to churches and fathers to be able to train their children the way that they should. Thousands of, of, of churches have been influenced by the book already gone and more and more now the book Ready to Return. Did you know in Ready to Return, you know what we found in our churches? The millennials regularly attending church in America, the 20-year-olds regularly attending church in America, regular church attenders, 40% say they're not born again. 65% say if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. 50% will not speak against gay marriage. You want to know where the church is going to be in a few years' time when they become the leaders? 
The Answers books, the four biggest selling creation apologetics books in the world, 120 of the top questions we've been asked over the past uh, 40 years with detailed answers. Young people, you get those answers and most of the questions you're going to hear, you'll find are answered in there because they're the, the questions that are asked today. And older people, mums and dads, you have those answers to give to your kids. I, I tell you, you bring them up on that, it make a big difference in their lives to see that they can defend the faith. We have detailed books on one race, one blood, on the six days and the age of the earth. And our research shows that kids start doubting the Bible at a very young age. So we produce a lot of material for young children, kindergarten, preschool, grade one, two. A.S. Random, we've seen more young kids commit their lives to the Lord through that than probably any other kid's book. And then D is for Dinosaur, N is for Noah. It makes the Bible real. You know, you know what kids say to their parents here over and over again? I hear it. And the parents come to me, our kids love the museum. It makes the Bible real. You know what the ark's going to do? Help make the Bible real. They want to know it's real. And we give them those answers. Books on dragon and dinosaurs. My son-in-law, Bodhi, wrote a book on the Tower of Babel. Do you know that many of the names in our cultures can be traced back to Ham, Shem, and Japheth? It is fascinating. You know, we have a, a PhD from Harvard University on staff here. And he's doing research on genetics. And you know what they found as they've mapped human genes all over the world? You know what they now found? They go back to three nodes. And they're doing it by looking at mitochondrial DNA, which is only inherited through the woman. And when they do that, it goes back to three nodes. What do you think we're going back to? Ham, Shem, and Japheth's wives. Exactly. I mean, it is phenomenal stuff when you look at all that. How do you know the Bible is true? Uh, another series of apologetics book that's great to equip us. Dinosaurs are, are used to try to convince kids and mums and dads the Bible's not true. This is our most popular book on dinosaurs. Another one that we released just recently. Book of History folds out, goes from Adam and Eve, and shows you how all those cultures fit together. 15 foot long, and then we have a more detailed one. Uh, my son-in-law Bodhi and Roger Patterson here at our ministry just produced two volumes on world religions and cults. This is all to do with the one religion, man's word. And then there's a volume three that comes out uh, at the end of this year. Guess what one of the religions is in volume three? Atheism. Because we need to keep saying, oh, when I say that on my Twitter, these they go nuts. We don't have a religion. <laughs> Boy, they're very zealous for their religion. Uh, that's what I've noticed about them. And uh, we have a, a complete set of materials, the, the debate with Bill Nye and two books dealing with how to confound the critics and answering all those questions. Uh, I, this is used by a lot of churches. It's six of my main talks done up as 12, 30-minute programs and a whole study guide to go with it. What I did today would be similar to this one here, always ready. And it's like a, a mini creation apologetics course, and it's very inexpensive. Many churches are using that for the young people and their adults. We use it at home for your homeschool. We have a three year Bible curriculum, Answers Apologetics. Thousands of churches are using it now. It's unique in the world. Kindergarten, preschool, right through adults. It's all the different age levels. And it's A for apologetics, biblical authority, chronological, chronological through scripture, teaching the doctrines, teaching biblical authority, and teaching apologetics all the way along, connecting Old and New Testament. And you can get uh, discounted kits out there. And then our Answers magazine, our special just came out, has a mini magazine for kids in the middle. And uh, I encourage you to subscribe. And if you purchase over $75 worth of materials, you'll, we'll give you a subscription for free. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be out here in the lobby if you want to come out and say hi. Uh, I'd love to uh, see you. And hand back to Joss to make uh, final announcements. Give me time to run out the door here.